Do we need this? That question hangs around HBO's adaptation of the hit video game The Last of Us like a noose. There was a tendency among a fair portion of fans of the game to roll their eyes at every new bit of news about this adaptation because of that question. And grappling with that question seems to be one of the main things the showrunners themselves were preoccupied by. Do we need this? Obviously, obviously not. Right? So then why do this? Uh, okay, yeah, fair. The Last of Us was a game that was already as close to a movie or a television show as a video game could possibly be. It's a linear narrative experience and a pretty much linear gameplay experience too. It was technically a video game, but in contrast to the rest of the industry, it was not one sold on the appeal of the player getting to shape the narrative. I suppose you have the choice over precisely how, or maybe if, you murder each group of enemies as you progress through the game, but the corridors themselves lead you inevitably from point A to point B. You will watch all the same cutscenes, listen to the same banter, see the same ending as anyone else who plays the game. It actually kind of melted people's brains at the time because of just how much it went against the grain of what so many other major video game publishers were doing in 2013. In an era where so many other games let you do a choose your own adventure, pick blue for boring, pick red for psychopath style gameplay, this sequence at the end of The Last of Us was legitimately surprising in that it uses all of the conventions of those kinds of games and leads up to a moment where you expect to have a choice only to not have a choice. Joel kills the doctor. Joel always kills the doctor. It's a linear experience and, not for nothing, a good one. So why do this? The motivation for adapting a story, or at least the most like pure motivation for adapting a story, is that you think the story will benefit from the shift in mediums to explore parts of the story that the original just couldn't. An audiovisual medium provides storytellers new ways to enhance a story told previously as a book or as a comic book. Music can create a different emotional reaction to a scene, and bringing something that was only previously in the realm of imagination into real life can be extremely satisfying. But The Last of Us was already in an audiovisual medium, and it used that medium to its fullest. Or rather, it used it in a way that aped the conventions of film. The composition of its shots, the editing, the music, its motion-captured performances, all of it working in tandem to create a well-crafted experience that kind of feels like... Well, it kind of feels like a prestige HBO drama. Naughty Dog games stand out from the rest of the video game industry for this reason. When two characters have a conversation in a Naughty Dog game, it's either happening in gameplay or it's a performance captured cutscene that emphasizes the subtleties of each character's emotions. They never just have two characters cycle through four or five generic animations while the player chooses from four or five dialogue options. That's not a criticism of games that do that, but an observation that those games want you to feel like you're interacting with the story Story, while The Last of Us wants you to feel like you're watching a story. The Last of Us did all of this extremely well, pretty much better than any other video game. It created dozens and dozens of really effective moments between characters that have stuck in my mind for a decade. You're not my daughter. And I sure as hell ain't your dad. So if you're adapting a story like this, you're in an extremely tough spot because you don't just want to thoughtlessly echo something like this, and yet the scenes are so good on their own, your story would be less good if you didn't include them, right? You're right. You're not my daughter. And I sure as hell ain't your dad. Oh my god, they shot it from a different angle? Which means that any adaptation of The Last of Us is destined to instantly be cut up by the internet into shot-by-shot -shot comparisons. The Last of Us Season 1 Side-by-Side -side Scene Comparison The Last of Us Episode 1 TV Show vs. Game Comparison The Last of Us Episode 2 TV Show vs. Game Comparison Episode 3 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 TV Show vs. Game Comparison So why do this? And more importantly, how? And more importantly, why? For a moment, I just want to set aside the obvious answer to this, which is money. The Last of Us is an extremely recognizable IP, and any adaptation of it, good or bad, was bound to make HBO a tidy profit. But that doesn't really answer why these specific creatives would want to be involved with this. Craig Mazin, the showrunner for The Last of Us, was fresh off a huge success with Chernobyl, a show that won or was nominated for all of the awards. He could presumably have been part of whatever he wanted to make. He chose this, so why? Fungal infection of this kind is real, but not in humans. True, fungi cannot survive if its host's internal temperature is over 94 degrees. And currently there are no reasons for fungi to evolve to be able to withstand higher temperatures. But what if that were to change? What if, for instance, the world were to get slightly warmer? 
Unlike the game, the TV show opens with a lengthy interview scene between a TV show host and a pair of doctors, which, in my mind, immediately seeks to answer the question at the top of this video. In the scene, one of the doctors outlines how a fungal pandemic could be orders of magnitude worse than a viral pandemic. He explains how the fungi could burrow into people's brains and turn them into puppets, handling a bunch of the world building for the rest of the show. But he also reframes the central catalyst of the apocalypse from what it was in the game tying it directly to climate change. That Craig Mason would do this is not that surprising when you compare this to what he did in Chernobyl. Like, yes, that show is about telling a story around the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, but it's not just about that. It's about climate change. Hot take, guys. Chernobyl had climate change themes. Institutions repeatedly ignored the warnings of an environmental disaster because of their own political agendas, and then in the midst of the crisis, attempted to continuously downplay how bad things could get. But Nuclear radiation doesn't care about international politics or what's happening inside the Kremlin, so, you know, can we please deal with this thing before it kills us all? In The Last of Us video game, there was no explanation for the apocalypse. It was just something that happened. But I think you can make a compelling case about the original Last of Us that while it is never explicitly stated to be about climate change, that it was subtextually about climate change. It's a game where most of the settings are urban environments that have been reclaimed by nature, where the main enemies are a kind of fungi, and where the central themes are all about pitting individual needs against what is good for society as a whole, a theme that has some extra resonance when seen through the lens of climate change. In the show, a guy just says it. What if the world were to get slightly warmer? He just tweeted it out. And it's in this way, this method, like not just this scene, but this way of doing things, that the show justifies its own existence. If it can't tell the story of The Last of Us better than The Last of Us already did, then it can at least tell the story more explicitly. It can make the subtext text. I want to make a distinction here for the kind of subtext I'm talking about. I'm not talking about what we could call conversational subtext. So in many a well-written scene in both versions of The Last of Us, two characters are talking to one another, and because they are human beings and not robots, when they say things, they don't always say everything they mean. So time heals all wounds, I guess? It wasn't time that did it. Joel's puppy dog eyes fill in the blanks of what his words imply. The text is, it wasn't time that healed his trauma. The subtext was that it was meeting and bonding with Ellie that healed his trauma. Both versions of the story have moments like this which are very good, because both versions are very good. So when I say HBO's The Last of Us turns the subtext of Sony's The Last of Us into text, I don't mean everyone starts saying what they mean literally. I'm talking more about the themes and plot points that the game originally left ambiguous. Cordyceps mutated. Some of it got into the food supply, probably a basic ingredient like flour or sugar. Example number one, Joel and Tess. Now, if you're a freak, like me, when you're playing the original game, there were probably a bunch of times during scenes with Joel and Tess when you thought to yourself, they fucking. Come on, make this easy for me. Canonically, the answer is probably, probably, like pro probably, De not definitely, but, but when you watch the show, one of the first times you see them together is they're together. In the original game, there was something ambiguous that players wondered about, and now in order to give this new version of the show some kind of identity that is different from the game, but which doesn't outright contradict the game, the show gives a solid textual answer to that thing that was previously ambiguous. Example number two, communism. Hey, isn't it kind of funny that in the post-apocalypse, the healthiest, most productive, most just and safe place in the entire game is kind of a narco-communist? Like Tommy and his pals over here, are communists, aren't they? And isn't it, you know, doubly funny that we put this location in Jackson, Wyoming, the state with the heaviest Republican lean in the country? 20 years of apocalypse turned all these macho conservative cowboys into Mikhail Bakunin? Well, uh, in the show... Everyone pitches in, we rotate patrols, food prep, repairs, hunting, harvesting. Everything you see in our town, greenhouses, livestock, all shared, collective ownership. So, uh, communism. Nah. Nah, I didn't like that. It is that, literally. This is a commune. We're communists. Example three. David is... Well, even worse than, than the game says. Okay, so in the game, Joel gets injured and the player gets to play as Ellie for a little bit, where she encounters this guy, David, who manages to gain Ellie's trust before she learns that he and his gang are a bunch of cannibals who are going to eat her. But there are a couple of moments in the game that make you feel like David is even worse than a cannibal. Like this moment when he tries to regain Ellie's trust and they hold hands, or in the final fight scene, which can be read as merely David attempting to murder her, or is he trying to, you know, the fighting is the part I like the most. There's no fear in love. 
Oh, okay, so he's just full on pedophile. Okay, got it. <laughs> Example four, Bill and Frank. Now I'd say the masterstroke of the series is how they handle its queer representation. In the game, Joel and Ellie meet one of Joel's old friends, a complete asshole named Bill. Bill lives in almost total isolation and has protected himself from the outside world with a series of booby traps. In his level of the game, the three of them work together to make it to the other side of town so that they can acquire a car battery. Bill has exactly one friend named Frank who lives on that side of town, but they find that he has hanged himself when they get there. For many players, it's pretty easy to miss the fact that Bill is a gay man, because that fact exists mostly in the subtext of how Bill reacts to Frank's death, which could imply a romantic connection between the two of them, but can also very easily be read by a straight audience as just a man mourning his friend. He was my partner. But Bill's queerness also exists as a non-mandatory content. In Frank's house, the player might find a note from Frank to Bill, which expresses Frank's growing resentment towards Bill's stuck-in-his-ways behavior. Again, the player needs to read between the lines here to understand that this is a queer relationship. I'm sure your friend will be missing this tonight. Mm -hmm. The only tangible piece of evidence of Bill's homosexuality is when Joel and Ellie are driving to Pittsburgh and Ellie starts looking at a magazine she got from Bill's house, which is a male porn magazine. In each case, it does require the player to think about what they're seeing in order to come to the conclusion that Bill is gay. Now this is all a bit <laughs> problematic. The fact alone that Bill's queerness is hidden to this degree is worth criticizing. And it was. Like, in a game, which again was almost entirely linear, the one important character detail that's consigned to optional content or blinking you'll miss it story beats being the pieces of evidence that let you know that there's a queer relationship going on here at all is not exactly what you'd call good queer representation. It's the kind of representation that is slipped in so that it's not noticed by most heterosexual audiences. Because that way the game avoids a reactionary backlash, I guess. But uh, come on, is that really something to worry about? Oh yeah, I, I guess so. Now arguably this moment of queer representation is better than nothing, but the showrunners wisely understood that they had to do more than this in the adaptation. So in the third episode of the show, they raise the queer subtext to queer text. It's the biggest narrative departure from the game by far. The writers craft an entire episode that is almost completely separate from Joel and Ellie's journey, telling a positive, impactful story about Bill and Frank falling in love with one another. It's a very good episode, but it's also a little irritating that in order for them to tell a good queer love story, it seems it has to be entirely sequestered away from the rest of the narrative. So what are we to make of all these decisions? In the case of the Bill and Frank episode, the show adds so much more to the story than anyone expected that it sort of ceases to be an adaptation of The Last of Us and more of a standalone one hour movie that happens to cross over with The Last of Us. With that exception though, the general strategy of raising the subtext up to the level of the text is pretty much the only way that this adaptation is able to establish its own identity separate from the game. But are these really ideal changes. I sometimes felt while watching the show that I was less watching HBO's Last of Us than I was reading Craig Mazin's PhD level thesis on The Last of Us. The Last of Us, climate change and the decay of American community. The Last of Us, queering the post-post-apocalypse. The Last of Subtexts. Oh wait, that's mine. <laughs> In calling out all of the subtext of the original story though, HBO's The Last of Us doesn't have much subtext of its own. All of its mysteries are thoroughly explained, all of its character relationships explicitly detailed. And, I don't know, it's, it's fine or whatever, but like, do we need this? One of the things I love about The Last of Us is its unique world building. All these interesting fungal creatures in a world with different factions, it's just a well-realized post-apocalyptic story. For me, world building is one of the most enjoyable parts of writing, and if you're a writer who needs a little help organizing their ideas, then I recommend checking out World Anvil, the sponsor of this video. World Anvil is an award-winning toolset used by millions of writers that helps you to create, store, and organize the setting for your world. You can track timelines, family trees, diplomatic relationships, and more. For me, the the hardest part of world building is keeping all of the different elements connected to one another. And in World Anvil, you can link from one idea to the next pretty easily. It's a great solution. To get your next story organized, you can check out World Anvil right now absolutely free. For a limited time, you can also receive 40% off any annual membership by using the code just right. 40% off? Wowee! Thanks, Sage! No! Thank you, because using that code supports this channel, wouldn't you know it? Once again, that's code just right for 40% off any annual membership. A big thank you to all of my patrons for supporting me on Patreon, including Michael Moss, Mitch Makarat, Zachary Gidding, 
and Dog Best Dog. If you want to help me make more videos like this one, then head over to patreon.com slash just write. And keep writing, everyone.